Attention, please. Uh, I'm not serving beer, so if that's what, why you all came for this, it's... But I do thank you for the attendance here. We I took a wild guess based on feedback from uh, the uh, people representing each of the golf groups from here um, and guessed about 200. But you saw we were pulling chairs out uh, when the 200 were filled. So thank you all for coming. Believe it or not, this isn't all the golfers, but a good share of them are going to get a head start on knowing the rules as of January 1st. There's quite a few changes. And uh, yeah, Robin and Roger come down from uh, Phoenix to give you uh, about a two hour explanation of the new rules. And we'll take that to get through all these. And I'll try to uh, control the questions, but there will be questions, I'm sure, uh, for further explanation of the rule changes that are coming up. So thanks for being here, and I'll present uh, Robin and Roger to take over. Thanks, Al, I appreciate it. And thanks very much, everybody, for spending your afternoon with us, and uh, we will do our best to clarify as many of the things as we can. Uh, Roger and I are both volunteers for the different American Amateur Golf Associations in Arizona. Uh, most of what we do are with the Arizona Golf Association, which are men. A lot of the junior golf association events, which are boys and girls, and we have lots of girls that are involved uh, in junior golf, which is great. And Roger and I also do a number of the uh, Women's Golf Association tournaments. There aren't quite as many of those, but we do get to remember those. So we're happy to be here with you. We did a seminar up at uh, Saddle One this morning. It worked out well. I know we're in this size of crowd. Uh, so for the distance in the back, uh, if you have questions, you might have to yell so we can hear you because you're almost in another county. But we'll do our best. And we didn't need the microphone this morning. Uh, because we're both loud, but not loud enough to get to the back. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the PowerPoint slides on the major changes. We're going to have for you, and we'd like to save them until afterwards, we have a handout that covers the major changes, and we also have a player's edition of the Rules of Golf for 2019, and we have 230 or so of those need more, we have more on the car, so we can work all that out. So, what we're going to do this afternoon, and I'll probably walk to the other side, because that's my usual side. Uh, I don't know if it's my left eye or whatever, but I'm usually on this side of the, of the uh, projected images. So, a couple of introductory comments. You've probably heard about the modernization effort that's gone on for several years, and lots of people were involved from all over the world, and also the tour organizations, and a lot of people, including yours truly, were involved in reviewing a lot of the materials. Uh, they didn't always accept my suggestions, which is okay, because it's not always a majority of the rules, it's the rulers the rule. And that's fine. The rules were des designed for 2019 to be more standardized and logical, which I believe they are. There still are some complications, uh, but for the most part, they will be easier to understand and a lot of uniformity in how procedures are done under the rules. Today, I would say the rules are very complicated in 2018. Uh, in 2019, most of the things that we all run across out on the golf course will be more understandable for us. The other item is that I'll take the first bullet more easily understood and applied. The current rule book 
And I know all of you who have studied the rule book continually is pretty much 19th century terminology and it's still that way for, it's probably been that way for 200 years, not just 120. And so the terminology is the, the way the, word, the rules are written are much more logical for us all to understand, I would offer. Uh, the words make sense, but also they are consistent and I would say very fair. You will see a number of cases that we go across today where there are no penalties for things that are penalties this year. And so, and many of them are unnecessary penalties in some of our views from this year. So, it's a good step. There still is, I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but really, golf is sort of a challenging game. Your ball is not always where you want it to be. But there are, I like the Richard Tuff's statement that a great assortment of strokes under a perplexing variety of conditions. You probably most of you have noticed that. So there's several publications, the four rules, and I can't hold up these books when I have two things in my hands, but there's a rules book that covers all the rules. There is a player's edition, which is the one we will have for you, that is a briefer view a description of here's what you do under this condition. So it's also really more differently. Roger's got the big book and the smaller book. And I think you will find the player's edition very helpful uh, if you're on the men's or women's rules committee or tournament committee, you will certainly want the full book. There's also an official guide for those of us who run tournaments or officiate uh, we need the book that gives us all the committee procedures, the local rules, and recommendations of how golf courses are marked, and so forth. So some of us will be needing that book for sure. And there will be digital, and as you can note, and hopefully with the new screen that just was available as of 1.30 today, uh, the text is big enough, hopefully for everybody in the back. The rules, for some of us who've been working on the rules for 15 to 20 years, like myself, uh, we've almost memorized the page number and what's in a particular rule. All of those numbers have changed. And so that's going to sort of drive some of us nuts, and it's differently organized. And so Roger and I, and many of the folks in this room, will have a hard time finding things in the book. But that's what we have to do. And so the most, we're going to talk again, most relevant changes, some of them are fairly straightforward and we won't spend as much time on those and the changes that are more complicated for you or any of us, but for golfers, we'll spend a little more time on those. And I promise, Al, that we won't be here any past six o'clock tonight with all of the things that we want to cover. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> So there's a lot of new terminology. A lot of the terms make more sense than they might this year. Uh, but there are new definitions because a number of things weren't defined in the past and some of the words are new, like natural forces and no plane zone. And we also have a number of, if you glance at this slide, the column on the left are the new renamed or definitions that are different and the ones on the right are the current definition the current terms that are defined and so one of the things that you will want to do as golfers is look at the definitions section this has been true for decades that the definitions are the foundation of the rules of golf if you don't know what the teaming area is uh, you're going to struggle, and if you don't know this year what the general area is, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because the parts of the golf course, which are now called areas of the course, have some differences in 2019 than in 2018. So, areas of the golf course. There are five defined areas, 
And the reason we need to know these is that the relief procedures and what is prohibited in these areas are all different. And so it's really like today, you need to know where you are on the golf course. You still need to know that in 2019. So this is an unusual way to define it, but it's actually the most efficient way to define it. We have a general area, which used to be called through the green. And does anybody know what through the green is? Not many people this year, but next year it is the same as through the green. But through the green, most people will, what does that mean? So we have a general area, it says it's the entire course except for the four defined areas. The team area, so that's where the whole you're being played, as it says on this slide. Bunkers are a part of the golf course, which is now an area. All penalty areas, and Roger, when he comes on a little bit, will spend much more time than we will at the moment talking about penalty areas. Uh, generally, it's things like lakes, ponds, but they can be other items, and Roger will continue with that subject. And then the putting green of the whole being played at the time. So it's really not much of a change other than we have penalty areas, and then the general area is everything else on the course other than these four areas. Abnormal course condition. Today we talk about abnormal ground conditions. That's kind of a misleading phrase, but it's an old phrase. It's been there for decades. So now abnormal course conditions are four conditions on the golf course. Somewhat straightforward, but I'll say not perfectly straightforward. An animal hole, which could be made by any animal, and there's a definition of what is an animal. We know most of them, it includes some other items. It's not just a burrowing animal, like it is today. Ground under repair, construction on the golf course, the superintendent's digging up a pipe, uh, things like that. Immovable obstruction, which is new because the deciding bodies have said, well, you know, in the old days, there weren't all these things built on the golf course. So that really is an abnormal course condition. And, by the way, you get relief from all of these areas. And so let's have them all consistent. And temporary water, formerly called casual water, just a very minor phrase change for that. There are some other things that we kind of need to know, we'll need to know this when we talk about all the relief procedures which are coming up in about 20 or 30 minutes. Dropping the ball is we're going to let go of it so it falls through the air and with the intent to put it into play. I always have to remind people in my seminars or my students at the Golf Academy that a dropped ball, you know, I take a ball out of my pocket, I fumble it, and it falls on the ground. Well, that's not in play. Well, where does it say that? Well, you're not trying to put it into play. So it's now a little more explicit, so we don't have arguments between Roger and I out on the golf course. When something happens, we say, no, it's clear the book. And that was a lot of the goal of the rules. Replace. And again, I don't want to confound the two years, but this year, sometimes we replace the ball by dropping the ball. Next year, we're never going to replace a ball by dropping a ball. We're going to place the ball. And so, replace, it has to be done with the hand, setting the ball down. You can't roll it to a spot with your partner. You need to set the ball down, and again, with the intent to put it into play. I mark my ball on the putting green, pick it up, set it down off the putting green. It's not in play. I didn't replace the ball. Integral object, we'll kind of jump over this. Uh, you can define things as integral objects on the golf course, but we'll kind of skip by that. Penalty area. 
And again, Roger will talk more, but a penalty area is again definitions we need to know, and there's more information to follow. But it's an area on the golf course from which the lead for the one stroke penalty is allowed if your ball is in the penalty area. It's obvious that ponds and lakes are penalty areas. They're no longer lateral water hazards or water hazards, they're penalty areas. But there will be other areas of the course that the committee can decide is a penalty area. And I'll just give you one quick example. There's an area of impenetrable woods. Uh, I played a tournament down at one of the old the Disney courses in Florida. And next to the fairway, it's, you almost couldn't even go in there. Well, that's going to be a penalty area in 2019. There is that you really cannot play out of or probably not even find your ball, but you know your ball's in there somewhere. So that's a simple case. Boundary object. We tend this year to talk about objects that define out of bounds. That sounds a little stilted. A boundary object is an artificial object, generally in cases defining out of bounds, walls, fences, and so forth. And a reminder that they're not obstructions. My students last week in the midterm missed that question almost universally. Conditions affecting the stroke. It's a good description of the items that are up on the sheet that say it's the line of the ball, which is now a defined term. Anything in italics is defined in the definitions. The area of intended stance, which includes the position of your body as well as your feet, that's well defined under stance, area of intended swing, and so forth. Again, something we need to know because I think we kind of know intellectually that if I'm out on the golf course at a bad spot, I can't take a chainsaw and start cutting down the bushes around my ball. Uh, I know Roger does that. He's not allowed to do that. It's clearly it's clearly in 2019. It's sort of oblique in uh, 2018. And improved, this was always in a decision, and it's clearer now, I would say, in the rules, and in fact, in the definition, that if a player gains a potential advantage by doing something, like trampling down the bush near his ball, his ball is in the, the sandy area or you know the, the desert and the player takes his or her wedge and digs out of a deep trench right behind the ball. Well, I don't think we're allowed to do that because you basically improve the lie for your area of intended swing. So there are some terms that will help us because these items come up periodically. We're going to talk about natural forces when the ball gets moved by wind or gravity. And so that's a new term that was on the new term list, but also it comes into effect when we're trying to figure out, okay, when the ball moves, what do I do next? Deliberate and accidental are two interesting words. And so we have a couple of examples, and if you have questions as we go along, we can help with those. Deliberate means this is not defined anywhere. This is a few of us trying to be helpful in interpreting some of the new words that are in the book. An action intentionally taken or intentionally not taken, but you're usually taken by the player where the player had a choice. The player lifts the ball thinking it's a strange ball and it's his or her ball. So I see a ball, I think my ball is another five feet down in the first cut and I go pick it up and it's my ball. And I try to explain to Roger, well, that was an accident. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and Roger says, well, Robin, you intentionally picked up the ball. Yeah, but I didn't mean to do it. No, you took it. You took it away and act to pick up the ball. And so that is a deliberate act, is when a player makes a conscious decision to do something. And that's an example. Accidental is a little different. 
Uh, one example of accidental is my ball's on the putting green and I drop my putter air as I'm leaning over to mark the ball. Well, I didn't drop it on purpose, it slipped out of my hand. That is an accident. I didn't decide to drop it. The person authorized to attempt the flag stick fails to remove the flag stick. They made a decision not to remove the flag stick. That was a deliberate action. So that falls in the intentionally not taken. So the player made a conscious act to let the ball hit the flag stick. Accidental, basically the example I gave, an accidental act is one that you did not consciously do on purpose. I'm walking up to my ball in market and I slip and my foot hits, moves the ball on the plane. That was an accident. I didn't try to. On the other hand, I'm not very happy with my shot. I go and I kick my ball 50 feet. Uh, I think that was a deliberate act. Well, I didn't mean to kick it 50 feet. Well, that's that's moot, as we would offer. Okay. Let me move on, and we'll also, you know, if something comes up that's really puzzling, if I'm not clear enough, you know, raise your hand and then holler to me or send me a text message if you're in the back row. <laughs> so there are a lot of changes. We're going to kind of go through these by set. As you can kind of tell here, there are a number of sets of items. Uh, they, some could be possibly in a different set, but the first set are these items where the ball is at rest and now we have to figure something out when uh, maybe it got moved somehow. And these, these are now going to be all changes, some are more significant changes than others. So today, and I gave an example this morning, it's one of my given ones. A couple of years ago, when the LPGA was out at uh, Superstition Mountain, one of the players was looking for the ball and walked past a bush, bumped the bush, she doesn't see the ball, and all of a sudden the ball drops out of the bush. Okay? Well, that was a one-stroke penalty several years ago. Because if you moved your ball during search, you got penalized. 2019, the rules don't care. There's no penalty for moving your ball during search. It does have to be replaced, as it says here, so no penalty. You know, we're not trying to move the ball. It's truly accidental, if I use that word. You don't see a ball. We're looking through the grass, and you'll see a video in a minute. And all of a sudden, look, there's my ball. And it moved. Well, we got a rule for that, and it says, put the ball back, have a nice day. <laughs> And you'll we'll see this sign in here a few times where it also says, and this is important for us, it shows up many times in the rules in 2019, that if we don't know the exact spot, and generally if we moved it, we don't know the exact spot because we didn't see the ball, that we're going to make or replace the ball on the estimated spot. And then remember, this year we would drop it if we didn't know the spot, now we're going to replace by placing with the hand, and we're going to make a good faith estimate, if I use that phrase, of where the ball's originally positioned was. Under the 2019 rules, there is no penalty if you accidentally move your ball while searching for it. If you do, you place your ball back on its original spot. If you don't know the original spot exactly, like this player, simply estimate it including how the ball was lying under the grass, and to replace the ball there. So, you know, the main point is, we want you to find the ball. And we don't want you to have to feel like you have to be so weary that you might get a penalty. And so, and as was commented this morning, is uh, quite a fine young man because he actually put the ball way down in the, in the grass instead of teeing it up on a green tee so he could get a better shot at it or teeing it up on a very high spot in the, in the rough. And so it, it is, you know, it, as you'll see later, there's a lot of comments about being respectful of the rules, game of honor, and doing your best to uh, play under the rules of golf. Just reminders. So moving a ball on the putting green, uh, this has been a local rule 
that could be adopted in 2017 and 2018. It is now in the book as a rule. And so, as it says here, no longer a penalty. This is in the absence of a local rule. If a player accidentally causes, causes the player's ball to move on the playing field, this could be by a variety of methods. Under the 2019 rules, if you accidentally move your ball or a ball marker on the playing field, there is no penalty. For example, if you accidentally move your ball in making a practice swing or in preparing for your stroke, drop your ball marker on your ball and move it. Move your ball with your foot. Or cause your ball marker to move. There is no penalty, and you simply replace your ball or ball marker on its original spot. So, again, makes sense. It's a good rule. We do have to decide, though, on some occasions, this is sort of a companion to that, and this what is in a decision uh, is clear in the rule now, as you see, we've got numbers up there, so you can memorize those now or memorize them tonight when you study the book. <laughs> so we have to know that it's known or virtually certain that the player caused the ball to move in many cases. And there's finally a number, 95%, which means that, you know, it's extremely unlikely that something else caused the ball to move, like wind or gravity. And so the main point here is that if something else caused it, then we're going to just move on. And if it was the, uh, the player who accidentally caused his or her ball to move, then it's a matter of, okay, there is no penalty and the ball will be replaced. Other than when your ball is on the pipe, if you take an action near your ball and cause it to move, you get a one-stroke penalty under the 2019 rules. However, you are only responsible for causing a ball to move if it is known or virtually certain that you did so. This means when it is 95% or more likely that you caused it to move. For this look, it is not virtually certain that this action caused the ball to move. Therefore, the ball is treated as moved by natural forces and played from a new location. When we're making this uh, determination or judgment, often it's the time that, you know, if the ball had moved within a second or two of when the player took his practice swing, we would probably say, well, he, he caused it to move. But in this particular case, it moved after some delay, and again, there's got to be some judgment, but it looked to me like it moved on its own, you know, gravity, wind, whatever, tough to grass, relaxed, uh, so there would be no virtual certainty that the player would cause the ball to move. So this, this is, again, it's a reminder. This shows up the concept with a few of the rules, but it basically says when the original position of the ball is not known, it's replaced, and again, replaced means placed with the hand, uh, on its estimated spot. And so, you know, this year it's dropped. If we don't know, now we're going to place it on the estimated spot. And, you know, if it was underneath a leaf or two or underneath an overhanging piece of vegetation, it's got to go back to that spot. Again, we need to make a good faith effort uh, and be honest. Estimating and measuring, this shows up again a little later, but some of the things that you'll hear from both myself and Roger is that sometimes players will do their best. They'll ask somebody in the group, do you think this is where my ball crossed the red line for the penalty area, whatever? And if everybody says, yeah, that looks good to me, and you play the ball, and then somebody, you know, maintenance guy says, oh, no, it's up here five yards. Well, if the players made a reasonable effort and gathered as much information as possible, which is that part about under the circumstances, and uh, make an estimate that uh, the player is fine with whatever he or she did. So re reasonable judgment. We have a later slide that sort of ignores the video that just reminds us 
of the stuff that often happens on TV, but again, it's going to be a judgment of did the player do what was reasonable for he or she to do, as opposed to being <coughs> careless in what he or she did. A rather simple one, we don't need to linger on it, but we know that today, if I play a stroke with my ball and it bounces off my golf cart, I get a one stroke penalty. If I play today, my ball hits a tree or the front end to the bunker, comes back and hits me or my golf bag, it's a one stroke penalty. Not in 2019. And of course, if you think about it, has anybody ever gotten a real advantage very often of having it bounce off? their golf cart and go to a lake or something like that? Is that a better deal? I don't think so. So again, something that I would offer really makes sense, but you also have to remember uh, that there is an occasion in stroke play only where if I putt and my ball strikes Roger's ball on the putting green, that I'm going to get a two-stroke penalty. So we still want balls on the putting green picked up with these other situations of the ball that hits something accidentally, uh, there is no penalty. And same thing in, in match play, if I if Roger and I are opponents and my ball hits him, uh, today I can cancel and replay the stroke, not next year. So the rules don't care when it hits your opponent, opponent's equipment, your own equipment, the only time is on the fighting ring. You need to pick up the balls and stroke play on the putting green. Uh, just as a reminder, and I think this is kind of logical, I haven't seen Roger or El Bowie do this too often, is to, uh, with the new rules, well, I'll just set my club down right behind the hole since there's no penalty so that I won't punch and have the ball go in the lake. Well, it's nice to have this in the slide that we have created, but it's probably not necessary. I don't think most of us are going to try that. Except for me if I'm playing against Roger and Trump. <laughs> Taking relief. A couple items here, and some of these we're going to need to really remember for sure. I will try to be clear on my discussions. Uh, one of them is how we measure where the drop ball, and now when we talk about relief, we're talking about relief from penalty areas, taking relief from card pads, unplayable, and so forth. So in those, we are going to be dropping the ball because we're not replacing the ball. We're proceeding under a relief rule. Uh, a reminder, we've covered this a couple times because it's a complicated subject. There will be fixed distances, and that will be clearer to you. And we also have a little item in here for time to search before the ball is lost, uh, which has to do with relief because if you have not found your ball and it's lost, well, you have to take relief for a lost ball. And reminding us, and this is again different about substituting a ball, and an embedded ball is also different in 2019. And this is also different. And I may get through most of these. If not, I'll turn them over to Roger when we take a break, but we'll see how we do. And we're not going to rush on these for sure, or Roger's part, which is next. So, measuring the size of a relief area. Now, in 2018, some of us who were afflicted by the rules and rules geeks and deal with a lot of players, we talk about the prescribed area for taking relief. That may not be a, a term that is normal for any of you, but we all have to adjust that in 2019, we will have a relief area for every time we are taking relief from whatever it is. And so the first phrase up at the top in bold, and we'll reiterate this a couple times, the relief area for dropping ball is a fixed size of either one or two club lengths using the longest club in the player's bag other than a part. Okay? So it's always going to be a particular length 
if I have in my bag a 45 inch driver, 45 inches is going to be the measurement of a one club length relief area, or it's 45 plus one more 45 if it's a two club length relief area. Okay? The players will still drop the ball, as it says. And there will be a specific relief area that are measured by that longest club. So it's the distance. You don't have to use the club, but it's the distance. So I would encourage you now and probably later to get in the habit of measuring with that longest club that's in your bag that's not a part. So as it says, the relief area is a fixed size And a club length, when they refer to a club length, it's always the length of that club. Robin, Robin it's, it's a fixed size for that player, depending on what clubs they've um, chosen to play with that day. So, you know, if you, if you, somebody may have a three wood that's 42 inches, their fixed size is 42. You have a driver that's 45. Your fixed size for measuring is 45 inches. So it's, it's player by player. Yeah, yeah, player by player. It's the longest club that that player has. The distance is the length of the longest club that that player has in his or her bag. So here's uh, a couple added little things to help us, and we'll see this in some videos as well. And so a ball that's dropped in the right way, there are a couple of requirements. There are actually three. One is that the ball will be dropped from knee high, and knee high is the height of your knee, which has a little bit of variability in the height off the ground. That's the height of your knee when you're standing erect. So if I'm kneeling on the ground, knee high isn't three inches from the ground. And that's kind of what that means. And so we'll see some videos of players acting these out, and I think it's helpful to see that. This is sort of a warm up. So the player and actually the partner could also drop the ball in uh, 2019. It has to be dropped straight down, which means you just you release the ball, you can't spin it, you can't throw it at the ground to find a nice spot or because you're angry. In order to be dropped in the right way, it cannot strike, hit, the player or equipment before it first hits the ground. Now, Roger may remind us later that if it lands on the ground and then bounces off the player's foot and stays where it's supposed to play, that's fine. But it can't land on my shoe, bounce off, and then end up within the relief area. Okay. So the next part is it must, in order to be dropped in the right way, besides being dropped by the player or partner straight down and not striking equipment or the player, it must be dropped in, and I tend to use the word land in, but dropped in the relief area. And then we'll also, this is another key point, so that's, is that it must stand remain, be at rest in the relief area. I want to change my words because it can actually land in, roll up, and come back. But so it has to come to rest in the relief area. So th these are fairly good graphics I will offer in terms of diagrams. You might not be able to read the uh, text all the way in the back. But the player on the left drops the ball in the right way, lands in the area, and remains in the area. And so what we need to do, we don't need to put little, you know, 20 little keys in the ground to define the area, but we do need to know the dimensions. And in this particular case, it's a one club length. That's what those black lines are with the heads on the end of them. And so the player on the left did everything that's required, dropped the ball in the right way, landed, hits the ground in the relief area, and remains in the relief area. Today, 
You may or not be a student of all these little nuances, but the ball can roll out of that area as long as it didn't roll near the hole, and it can roll quite a distance out of the area. Not in 2019, and this actually makes a lot of sense since I can tell you that most tour players think the ball has to stay in the area. Uh, they often have to be reminded that uh, today the ball does not have to stay. In the second, the center slide for the second image, it shows when the player has dropped the ball, it lands in, hits the ground in the relief area and comes outside. Now, here's the bad news if you don't fix that, and then we'll back up. If the player were to play that ball, he or she would get a two-stroke penalty for not doing what the rule requires. So a lot of what we're trying to do for you and with the rules is to make things straightforward enough that it's easy to do the right thing. And so my opinion is, if you know the size of the relief area because you measure properly or you know what 43 or 45 or 42 inches is, you drop it in the right place and it stays within that area, you're in good shape. Now, the good news, and we'll bring this up again a little bit, is that if the ball lands and rolls outside, you can pick it up and do better the next time and drop it again maybe in a different spot within there, so it does stay, and if it rolls out again, then you place it where it landed on the second prop, okay. which is similar to this year, but now we're saying that it must remain in that area. On the right side, which also has the little X up at the top that says, uh, no, this didn't work. If the ball hits the ground outside the relief area and rolls in and is played, that's a one-stroke penalty for not getting it into the relief area in the right manner, which would be similar to dropping it from shoulder height or tossing it on the ground instead of dropping it at knee height. So again, in this case, the player did not do what he or she was supposed to do and you can pick up that ball for free and try to do better the next time. So, and I, as I've commented before, that this is a little subtle because it's different than currently. If the drop ball, like in the left panel, were to land on the ground, bounce off the player's foot, and still stay in the relief area, it is in play properly under the rules of golf. So that's going to be a little subtle, but I would offer that when we're now dropping from knee height, the ball is more likely to be land where we want it to land, and it's not going to be moving at 33 feet per second per second, uh, and then rolling to some odd spot on the, uh, on the golf course. <laughs> And, you know, as we said before, if it, if it rolls outside, like in the center panel, you can drop it again. And if it rolls outside again, pick it up and place it where it landed on the second drop. But I think there'll be much fewer opportunities to have to fix things in the future when they, the ball's being dropped from behind. Not impossible. I'm on lots of golf courses where uh, in the desert, on a slope, that ball is going to roll for 20 feet. And so then we'll drop it twice, it rolls for 20 feet, and then we find a place where it will stay at rest. When dropping your ball under the new rules, the likelihood you will need only one drop will increase, while the randomness of your resulting lie will be preserved. The procedure is simple. Hold the ball at knee height, let go of it so it falls straight down, and make sure that it lands and comes to rest in the relief area. Don't throw, roll, or spin the ball, and don't let it hit you as it falls. So, so you notice in this case, and I think as Roger mentioned this morning, the, the shorter you are, the more likely it is the ball will stay where you drop it. But uh, the other thing you'll notice is that uh, most of these players didn't measure. 
that they were very careful to drop the ball clearly within the one club line. Now, they also all have grass. Do you have all grass on these golf courses out here? The answer is no. Uh, Arizona is a little bit different, and so we will still have some challenges of getting, of getting the ball in the right place uh, as, after we drop the ball. We talked about this before, but again, this is such a big change, and we had some really good questions about that, this this morning uh, over at Saddlebrook 1. So a club length is defined as the length. You, we don't care what club you use, but the length is going to be different than sometimes the club you use. If you were to use a putter or a wedge to measure, if you have a 42-inch club in your bag, the ball has to land within one club length, not near the hole of the 42-inch club. And so where possible, and probably a good practice for the first part of the year anyway, is to try to hit the driver with you when you're taking relief from some situation. Because there are ways that you can get into difficulty if the ball, you use a short club and the ball rolls just slightly longer than that short club out to the, from where you set your tee and you pick it up and redrop, that's not a good thing because it might have been fine with your longer club. And so we need to have our brains it's the length of my driver or my tree wood, wherever I use, is my longest club for the day. So it's a fixed size. And some, again, you'll see more of these with Roger in a little bit. It'll be the one or two club lengths, depending on the rule. And as Roger also said, it's based, it's for fixed size for each player and determined by the clubs the player has in his or her golf bag. And again, we're being a little redundant, but I think some of us know or predict that there could be some issues around this because when Roger and I officiate, uh, somebody has a club, we say, well, you know, you can measure with any club. Well, next year, after we say that, we're going to say, oh, wait a minute, it's not any club. You really need to measure with your longer club or at least drop it in the right spot. Uh, we added some notes. Because there's often, and again, I'll use tour players, advanced amateurs that I officiate with during the year. There are often some confusions over where, where can you drop a ball if you're in a bunker or if you're on, near the putting green, if your ball's on a sprinkler head near the putting green. Whoa. I can measure out a club length and now I'm on the green. Well, that doesn't work. The rules don't allow for that. So, as it says here, uh, relief procedure one or two club lengths for free relief. And that, those phrases are now in the book that way free relief. The relief area must be in the same area of the course as the reference point. So if I just kind of go back for a moment, is my ball's on a sprinkler head, or I'm standing on a sprinkler head right near the putting green, and my ball is in the general area, which means it's not on the green. I have to drop the ball, the relief area is in the general area of the golf course, which does not include the putting green. So we're not dropping for free relief, we can't drop it to another area of the golf course. I think, Robin, um, a good example of that is if you're more within a bunker and you're, you're um, taking relief, you can't get outside of the bunker by taking you know, two club lengths and, and dropping in into a different area. Right. Yep, exactly right. And we'll see an a image of that later on. Yes. Okay. So the question has to do with if you're in the rough and your club length takes you to the fairway, well, if we go back to the definitions, the general area is every part, every entire area of the course except for team ground, penalty areas, bunkers, or putting green. 
So the general area includes the desert, it includes the rough, it includes the fairway. And so all of those are the same part of the course. Uh, it's often assumed by many people, which would include tour players, I can tell you from personal experience, that well, if your ball's in the rough, you have to stay in the rough. Well, it doesn't say that in the book. But I also accept the fact that that's kind of subtle because it just seems illogical that you should get from five inches of rough to uh, fairway. And I know when Fuzzy Zeller who told me when I was refereeing his group several years ago, uh, first he said to me on the first tee, he said, uh, we don't need you to come with us. We can manage without you. <laughs> and I said, well, Fuzzy, I'm assigned to your group and uh, I'll, I won't be there to bother you if you need me. Well, his ball was on his sprinkler head in the rough. And he called me over, and after he dropped in the fairway, I was his best friend all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, just one of the little episodes that can handle. Uh, but it, it's kind of logical that we should be able to do that, but it is the same part of the golf course. Yes, sir. Absolutely. For penalty of relief, maybe I got that. For penalty relief, the relief area may be any area of the course except the same penalty area. So, uh, and again, it sounds sort of illogical, and I have players on case say, well, you can't drop on the play grid. Well, if you're taking a penalty you stroke, you can. The measurement goes to any part of the course that you wish. Drive on the putting green, fourth hole at Kirsten, ASU Kirsten. Uh, that's the best place to drop. Why would you drop on the fringe when you drop on the putting green? Yeah. So uh, this is sort of a repeat of what, what the diagram showed before, that if the ball is played from within the correct relief area but was not dropped in the right way, it's a penalty of one stroke. So again, if I kind of drop it from shoulder height or I throw the ball on the ground because I'm not happy that I'm lying six on a part three, uh, you know, I'm going to get a one-stroke penalty for not putting the ball in the play the right way. But if I don't play from the correct relief area, for example, again, the ball's near the putting green, I drop on the putting green because my club gets me there and I play it, well, that's a two-stroke penalty because I didn't play from the right place is a way to look at it. Uh, Robert, we had a question. 19 points. When dropping, um, we had a question this morning related to dropping from knee high. And, and, and it's very important to remember, it's not dropping from higher than knee high or not lower than knee high. It's actually knee high. So if you drop from here, then that's not dropped in the right way. Um, it's got to be a, a knee high. Yeah, good. Thank you. In the 2019 rules, when dropping and taking free relief or penalty relief, your ball must be dropped in the defined relief area, and it must come to rest in there too. Most of the time, with the knee high dropping procedure, that will happen on your first drop. When it doesn't, drop a second time. If that drop doesn't stay within the relief area either, place a ball where your second drop first touched the ground. So I, I actually really like these videos because you can read the words, but I like the images. If I can visualize it, I have a much better chance that I'm going to get it right. Uh, a couple more, and then we'll give you a little break for a while. So, uh, occasionally, we have a lost ball or it's out of bounds. And so, there is stroke and distance relief. It's different than this year in terms of, unless you're from the tee, for the putting ring. But it depends where you're playing from. We kind of know that if you played from the teeing area, Hit a ball out of bounds or lost, yeah, you just play from the team area again. That's pretty simple. The general area or a bunker or a penalty area. So I hit my ball out of bounds from a bunker, or I hit my ball out of bounds from an area marked with red lines. 
Uh, we are going to drop in a relief area again. It's going to be one club length, the same way we've been measuring before. And within one club length of the spot where we last played on the same part of the golf course. So if I'm, again, from a bunker, I can't measure a club length and go outside the bunker because that's not the same part of the course. And so, but and it's not like this year where we basically drop as near as possible to where we last played, which is kind of what golfers do. There is going to be a one club length area, like in the middle of the fairway, where we drop the ball anywhere within that area. And again, it has to stay in that area in order to be meet the requirements of the rules. On the putting green, we're going to place the ball. So I put my ball on the playing green and it goes in the lake and I'm going to take stroke and distance relief. I put down another ball on the putting green and play it from that spot. Still costs me a stroke. And if it's lateral relief is now a different relief. We're going to talk about three kinds of relief. One is stroke and distance. Lateral relief is similar to the two club lengths today from a lateral water hazard, but it's referred to now as lateral relief. And we'll look at, there'll be a couple of slides coming up or videos. We also have back on a line relief where we choose a point on the reference line, and you'll see several examples of this, and that reference line is from the reference point, which is either the ball or where it crossed the penalty area, and the flagstick. And again, we've got some good examples of those. When you drop in relief areas defined by one or two club lengths, in the 2019 rules, a club length will always be the length of the longest club in your bag, except your butter. For most players, that club will be their driver, but not always. This player is using his driver to measure his two club length lateral relief area outside the red penalty area. This player's back on the line release area is one club length on either side of and behind the point he has chosen on the line from the hole, rule where his ball was unplayable in the bunker. He is estimating the size of his relief area without measuring then dropping well within one club length of that point. Finally, when a player measures with a shorter club, it is still the longest club in their bag, except the putter that defines the relief area. Remember, when you drop, your ball must always land in, come to rest in, and be played from the relief area. Roger will give you some additional information on back on the line relief because it's not, not for free when you're taking a relief from the bunker. Yeah, that, this is specific stuff around being taking on by the bunkers. Yeah. So I'll cover this slide and then we're going to take 10, 12 minute uh, break. You can ask us questions during the break and then Roger will pick up. There's still some items under this category. Uh, but since we just talked about some of these relief procedures, here's something that's very different. Today, if your ball's on a cart path, you have to pick up that ball and drop that ball. In the future, every time you take relief, you can drop, and are dropping a ball under a relief procedure, you can change the ball. So I'll give you just a quick example. I'm taking relief from a cart path, I have a yellow ball on the card path. I drop a white ball and it rolls back on the card path. I go back and I get an orange ball and I pick that ball and drop that. You can change every time you drop the ball or place it if you drop twice and then place. So the requirement to use the same ball or once you substitute and have to re drop, use that same ball which is way too confusing for any of us to even discuss. Uh, that's all gone, and it's much simpler in 2019. And so just quickly, you can substitute for all of these conditions. And of course, if your ball's out of bounds, unplayable, stroke and distance, those are pretty obvious. 
but uh, it's basically every time you take relief, you can use a different ball. And that's, I, I, the word they use in the book is another ball. So, okay. Uh, we'll hold this one, and Roger can talk about it afterwards just to finish it up. But let's take a break for about 10 or 12 minutes, and we'll try to keep us as close to schedule as we can. Thank you. Can we come back and please have another break?
You got extra seats here if you want to sit here. Yeah, there's no one sitting next to you. You have a surprise speech in town, you know? You have a surprise all right, um, we're just going to carry on with this. I think this is a an example of um, being able to substitute the ball, but we'll find out. When the 2019 rules let you lift your ball to take relief instead of playing it as it lies, you will be allowed to either use your original ball or substitute and use a different ball. In the 2019 rules, you are allowed to substitute a ball when taking free relief, as well as when taking penalty relief. This player is substituting a ball when taking free relief from a card pack. Okay, um, I, a number of people were talking about this back of the line of relief um, during the uh, intermission, so you know, we'll talk about that right now. Um, one of the options for relief from a penalty area, be it a red line penalty area or a yellow line penalty area, those are sort of equivalent of battle water hazards now and, and uh, water hazards. Um, one of the options is to go back on a line from the flag through where the ball lies um, and, and drop it anywhere on that line. There's been a, a couple of changes. Right now you can drop it anywhere, and you don't have to, but you have to get it as close to that line as you, as you can. In the new rules, you should pick a spot on that line Put a T in, recommended, not required, and then you have a relief area that is one club length, but no nearer the hole from that spot where you selected on the line. And that's where you need to drop the ball, knee height. The ball needs to um, land in that relief area and remain in that relief area. So, difference currently, you can pick anywhere on that line and you've got to drop it. On the line, now you find a spot, and now you get the relief area. I think that's generally consistent throughout all of the relief procedures that you do. You identify a reference point, and then you figure out a relief area to drop the ball in. Um, you know, th there's never a case where you have to drop the ball as close as possible to a spot. It's always within a mile or two club length area. So hopefully that. Okay, so that's pretty much what I said. Um, we're going to repeat this again. Well, that actually, that, that's a, it's similar to what, what happens now if you cross a red line in, into a water hazard. You, you can sometimes take a line from the flag to where it crosses the red line and go back. That's still available in, um, in 2019. But again, the procedures are all different. You can pick a spot and then you find your relief area on that kind of line. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Well, you're allowed to find a reference point anywhere, but once you've established that, if you drop it, it rolls forward, it's not in the reference area, and you play it, then yes, you play, um, you play it under penalty. Now, you can pick it up and correct that, and you can actually correct it by picking another spot on the line. That, that, that's, that's a subtlety that, that's not always obvious. But again, you find that spot, find your relief area, and then you drop it. Um, um, and if it happens again, you get to place it on that one. We, we recommend that you, you actually put a T in the ground. 
Um, the, the rules allow you to just drop it within the one drop lake area or lake spot that you have in your head. But that becomes a little tricky because if the ball, that spot that the ball hits the ground on becomes the reference point, that distance from the, from the, the flag is the reference point on the line from the flag. So if you dropped it two feet to the left of that line, that spot, you come over to the line, and that becomes your reference point. It's a little, I would always recommend you put a tee down on the line, and now there's no question about where the, the, the club lengths are measured from. Um, and you've now got a feet area to drop forward. I don't know if, if anybody has any questions about that, so little subtlety that um, the rules allow you to do, so, so then you're operating with the six and it's No, it's never closer to the hole than the reference point. Right. It's always going to be a, a less than a semicircle. Um, drop zones are a little different, but. Um, okay. Roger, we have another question over here. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'm hoping I haven't confused. I, the, the, the question was, um, uh, let me change the question a little bit. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm almost certain I should have gone into this subject. But anyway, um, you're, you're taking a line from the flag through where the ball lies and, or where across the margin of the of a penalty area, and you're coming back on a line. We recommend you put a T in to find the spot that is your reference spot to define the, the reference area. If you didn't do that and you happen to drop the ball to the left of that line, the distance from that spot where it hits the ground on the line to the flag becomes your reference point. So it's as if you put a T in the same distance from the flag as where the ball hit the ground, but on the line, and then you measure from there. Robin is going to graduate. I, I think part of the question may have been when you measure a club length to the left of the reference point into the right. If you drop it on the left side of the line and it rolls outside, can you now drop it on the right side of the line in the oh. same relief area? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you re drop, you drop it anywhere in that area and you're absolutely fine. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry, I misunderstood the, the, the question. I don't think we got back to the confusion that I created. Um, <laughs> Did, did that answer the, the person that asked me what the question was? So now we know what the question was, and hopefully the question is answered. Any, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, same thing. I mean, this, these are consistent things. If the ball comes to rest outside the relief area, um, you get to redrop it. Um, just because you're going back on the line, you, it's the same thing. You've got an area to drop the ball in, it's got a, Hit it, it's got to stay there. You've got to play it from there. And if you can't get it to come to rest on that spot, then you find a nearest spot where it will come to rest. But again, you're placing it at that point, so you should be able to find something. <coughs> and this is why I said you can find a new reference spot if you have to redrop it, uh, a reference point. I'm um, not sure why you would, but you could do that. When taking relief from a penalty area for one penalty stroke, one of your relief options in the 2019 rules is going back on the line. Follow these steps. Estimate the point on the edge of the penalty area where your ball last crossed as it went in. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through that estimated point and extending behind the penalty area. Go back as far as you like and identify a spot on that line. Measure or estimate a one club length wide relief area on either side of and behind that spot. In the 2019 rules, a club length is always the longest club in your bag, except your putter. Then drop a ball in your relief area, 
Your dropped ball must land in and be played from the relief area. Okay. There's a change for taking relief from an embedded ball. The current rule, um, you have a ball that's embedded in some pitch mark made by the stroke that got the ball there. You lift it, you can clean it, and you have to drop the ball as close as possible to where it was, which is always tricky. You can't fix the hole before you do that. In the, in the new rules, very similar procedure. The reference point is immediately behind where the ball was plugged in in the grass. And then you measure your one club length relief area around that spot and then drop it anywhere in that area. You can fix the hole where the ball was, that's allowed now. Um, and I think that's, oh, and, and I, I think Robin kind of talked about this. The current local rule, you need to have a local rule in place in order to get relief from an embedded ball um, through the green or in the general area, you know, in the rough, somewhere that's not a sandy area or in the fairway. The, the new rule is that you always can do that, but the committee can restrict you to just getting relief from an embedded ball in, in a closely known area. So they kind of flip-flop that. Which is great because we don't have to keep putting that into our notices to you know, tell people that they're allowed to take uh, relief from embedded ball in the run. Is there a definition for embedded? Uh, I, I believe there is, and, and essentially it's the, the, the ground, the level of the ground has to be, the ball has to be below the level of the ground, part of the ball. Um, so it's, it's the soil or the ground that has to have an indentation in it. You can certainly have grass between the ball and the, and the, 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 the indentation, but you know, part of the ball has to be below the level of the soil. But my approach out to the green creates a pitch mark, pops out, which is behind the pitch mark. I play the ball, I did not fix the hole. I would say that is true. But if it stayed in the pitch mark, I could fix the hole. Yes. Really strange. <laughs> right. Yeah, and there's a diagram on page 100 for when the ball is embedded. So it's in your little book that you have. It gives you a you know, cross section through the, the, the ground so you can see that it has to break the level of the soil. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions about the and, and then the uh, restriction, you, know, you, you don't get relief for a ball that's embedded in sand. Um, uh, outside of the um, and again, you can substitute or you can drop the original ball. That's you know, your choice. And the reference point is right behind where the ball was embedded. On the putting green, you get to um, fix the spot and put the ball back. Um, you know, where, where it was on the green. You can always you know, mark it that your ball was on the green, whether it's embedded or not. And they talk about it's repairing the ball mark, even though you ball is in it. Okay, so let's talk about lost balls and provisional balls. Um, lost ball, currently in the rules, you, um, you get five minutes to search, which is an awful long time. When you Check your watch. Um, in the new rules, it's three minutes. It's reduced to three minutes. Um, the second thing about that is that if you if your ball is lost and you can't find it, the three minutes is up. Then your only option in the rules is to take stroke and distance, um, which is to go back to where you previously played the shot from. Um, Currently, there's some restrictions on when you can play a provisional. If you've gone forward to search for the ball, you can't come back to the, the, the where you played the previous shot and say, I'm playing a provisional. It's no longer a provisional in the current rules. With, with 2019 rules, as long as the three minutes is enough, you can search for a minute, come back to where you previously played, play a provisional from there. The whole purpose of provisionals is to save time. 
as long as you're within that three minute per second time. So um, that's, that's a, a, a difference from the uh, current. As long as the ball hasn't been lost, then before you take that provision, then you're, you're good. You uh, cannot play a provisional if your ball is um, in a penalty area. Um, but if it's lost outside a penalty area or out of bounds, if you think it might be, then you can uh, play the provisional to save time. <coughs> you, got, you still got to announce, you still got to tell your, your playing competitors that you are playing a provisional. You don't have to identify the specific number on the ball, but it's always a good idea to know that so that you can distinguish it from your original ball if it happens to end up in the same place. Um, the only thing you have to do is say, hey, I'm playing a provisional. I'm playing this ball provisionally. You can't just put one down and say, oh, I'm just going to play again. That, that's not a provisional, which is the same as the current ball. You can continue to play your provisional until you until it, 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 it is in a place closer to the hole than where your original was likely to be. So if you hit a 200 yard drive into the jump and then you announced you were going to play a provisional and you hit it 100 yards in, you know, into, the, into the fairway, you can continue to play that until you get to that ball gets beyond where your original ball is likely to be. From that point on, you, you can't play it anymore um, as a provisional. That's, that's the same rule that we have right now. Um, and the, again, the idea is to save time. You, you, you don't want to be going forward to search and then come back and play your provisional. As long as you don't get to where the original is likely to be, then you can continue to play it. Yes? <laughs> yes, yeah, I know, I know the rule. I know the rule. Okay. Hi, Robin. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is um, there is a local rule in the current rules that say if, if, you, if you are uncertain as to whether your ball is in a water hazard, maybe it's a water hazard you can't see, then you can certainly play a ball provisionally until you can determine whether it is, is in there. Um, is that local rule still available under the new rules? You know that weird one that well, the, one, the, the current decision is one that I caused, decision 27-2A slash 2.5. <laughs> and, and, and the words are actually the way Roger has them on the slide pretty much. If your ball may be lost, outside the water hazard or out of bounds. And what that means is it's not factual, is it? I hit my ball somewhere and I don't know if it's in the water hazard or not. I'm, but I may not find it, I'm permitted to play a provisional ball. So the words mean the same thing as that reference decision. If a ball may be lost, you know, I'm on the tee, I hit my ball, I don't even know whether there's a water hazard or I see some red snakes, but I see tall grass, I see bushes and stuff, and after I hit my ball, I didn't even look because I was just saying words to myself. Uh, you know, I don't know how to play a provisional ball. I think it may be lost outside of water and I do I think the complexity of that situation though is if 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 you do find your ball, if you do find your ball in that water hazard, then the provisional ball, there's some complexity as to what it is. Is it a provisional ball for a relief from the water hazard? Well, no. 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 Yeah. No. It, if your ball is in the hazard, you get up there and somebody in the next group or the maintenance guy says, yeah, your ball landed in the pond. Well, when, you're, when it's known that your ball is in the water hazard, the provisional ball becomes a wrong ball forever. And it has no status on the ball, so you have to pick it up. Let, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about that moment more afterwards. Okay, all right. It's, it's, we'll talk about it later. And you're probably right, though. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the things that you can and can't do that are specific to the areas of the course that the ball is in. Ball is on the putting green and it, it, it moves. When do you get to put it back and when do you um, play it from where it, it ended up? Normally, you hit the ball onto the putting green. It comes to rest and then the wind blows it off. You get to play it from where it ended up. If you're on the putting green, um, so in that case you haven't lifted it or replaced it, it just ended up on the putting green and then it just blew off. Unfortunately you get to play it from where it comes, in, when it comes to rest. If you have lifted the ball and replaced it on the putting green, you always put it back in that spot, regardless of how it moved. If the wind blew it, if a twig fell out of a tree and knocked it, if you kicked it, if that spot where you lifted it and replaced it is reserved for that ball. So that's a, a, a change to 2019 rules. If you're on the green, um, and Grounded your club behind the ball and the wind blows, moves the ball. You don't touch it because the wind moves. It. That's considered to be a strong. Well, that, that was an old rule that if you address the ball and then the ball moved, you were automatically being to have a good course of the wind move. That went away four years ago, Robin? 2012. 2012. So now, all you've got to do is to figure out whether there was whether it was not a virtually certain that you caused the ball to move when you put your club behind the ball. That's that's the standard that you have to meet. Um, and it, whether you grounded it or not doesn't make any difference. It's, a lot of times it's how close to when you put your club down does the ball move. Did you touch the ball with the club? All those things are you know, used to determine that. If, if, and, it, and again, if you haven't lifted it and replaced it, and the wind moves it, regardless of whether you've grounded your club behind it, you still have to play it from where it lies. It's the lifting and replacing it that reserve that spot. <laughs> so that's, that's really what we're saying there. Excuse me. I want to make sure I've got this right in my peanut brain. <laughs> Ball is on the green, I mark it, I lift it, I clean it, I replace it. I walk over to the golf cart to take a sip of beer. <laughs> the ball moves. Okay, so here's the situation. You've lifted your ball, you've cleaned it, you've replaced it, you've then moved it off to your golf cart, and then the ball moves. Okay, what's the, what's the question? Do you, you play it from where it moves too, right? No, no, no. Because you lifted it and replaced it, you always move it back to that spot, regardless of what force it's in. Okay. Yeah, the, the second bullet point, I think, is pretty clear. The ball of slavery has been lifted and replaced, and then moves for any reason the ball must be replaced on its original spot. I mean, that's really the capsule of what Roger, and it's, it's a very different concept, which is going to cause us all a lot of challenges for sure, but that's probably the key statement among all the statements that have been discussed on the subject. Very different than in the past. Very and then, different. And the, the unfortunate thing is, if you don't understand that, and you decide, well, I didn't cause it to move, I gotta play it from where it ends up, you get a penalty for that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's helped you out because the ball may have rolled into a water hazard, but you gotta be careful that you don't misunderstand this and, and end up playing the ball from where it ended up after you lifted it into the place. Very key point. Question? I, I don't see. How the rules work? You said earlier, the ball isn't 
move to the detention room now you're saying that it is. Well, this, you know, this is this is this is this is on the putting green only. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so it is it is that this is marker down in the ball room, there's no penalty. Technically it's no penalty. Right. And now you're saying if you don't intentionally move the ball, it is a penalty. No, I'm not saying that at all. What what I just said was if you don't put it back, you mark the ball, you lifted it, you put it back. And then it moves for whatever. If you don't put it back, there is a penalty. Because as the word says there, that second bullet, the ball that's been lifted, replaced, and then moves, it must be replaced. That's, that's I, I understand. And, and we know this is a challenging concept. I mean, we understand that completely. And, and again, we're, we're mainly talking here about natural forces that if you cause it to move, and, and if you haven't lifted it and replaced it, you would have to pay it from where it ended up. But if you've done that action of lifting it, replacing it, you always put it back. After you mark, lift, and then replace your ball on the putting board. If it moves for any reason, including for your own accidental actions, or for some other reason such as wind. <laughs> Always replace your ball back on its original spot. If you don't know the exact spot, estimate it as accurately as you can, and replace the ball later. Okay, any, any questions on this complicated situation? <laughs> Um, current rules have a lot of restrictions on touching the line of putt is the term used now in the, in the 2019 rules. That goes away. It's always the line of play, even on the putting green. So a lot of restrictions now with touching your line of putt. Um, in 2019, a lot of those, uh, in fact, all of them are eliminated as long as you are not improving the conditions affecting the stroke, which is a term that we used before. So as long as you're not stamping a hole, you know, a line down to the to the <laughs> you can do a lot of things now that you didn't do this year. That's the, you know, the prohibition on improving his role on the plan of the Under the 2019 rules, when you are assessing the line for your putt, there will be no penalty if your caddy or partner touches the putting green to point out where you should aim or how your putt will break. This includes touching the green with the flag stick. So that, that action that he took would be a penalty if your partner um, but, but it's no longer a penalty. As long as he hasn't kind of improves the line of uh, play and it's good. Um, it also deals with issues, I don't know if anybody used um, aim point, where you're standing astride the, 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 the line of putts. We no longer care about you doing that. I mean, right now it's a, it's a problem for us because the line of putt currently extends a reasonable distance from either, either side of where you want the ball to go. So is he standing on it? Is he not? I don't know. If you deliberately stand on it right now, you get them. Um, those those things all go away as long as you're not improving your line of play. Is, is uh, picking up leaves or grass or whatever, is that improving your line in 2019? Could you say the question again? I'm sorry. The question is, if you pick up grass or leaves or anything that's in the way on your line, is that oh, Are we talking on the pine green? On the pine green. Well, you're talking about loosened patterns, right? Leaves, trees, anything that's, that's loose. You can move those anywhere. On the putting green, through, uh, in the general area, we'll talk about it in a second, in the bunkers as well. As long as the ball doesn't move when you do that, um, in, the, in the general area or um, in, 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 I think in the bunker too, right? If you move them. Um, on the putting green, you you can 
that's 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 okay to, to move a loose impediment if it moves the ball you have to put it back. No, you misunderstand my question. Okay. It's not just around the ball, it's on the entire line from where your ball is to the hole. Yep, that you can do that. That's not the, the rules don't consider that um, improving the line of it's, it's it overrides that. So I played behind a 300 pound guy the other day and he drug his feet everywhere. Do I get to, do I get to tap? We're going to get to that in a second. That's a very good question. Uh, okay, so the question, you know, foot marks, if someone drags their feet and scuffs up the green, what can you do about it? We're going to come as a, as a slide and talk stuff. Okay. So, okay, if Parker play and your Parker no longer be penalized for standing in the line of play, behind you or, or, or past the hole. Okay, so you're talking, the question is if you're uh, in playing a four ball or a four seven and you have a partner, um, right now partner can't stand behind you. Um, I, I don't think that that's really what we're talking about here. Um, we're, we're really talking about touching the line of play. We're not talking about you know, whether there's, there's another slide that comes up about um, being able to provide um, uh, before you take your starts standing behind that line, but, but maybe Robin can answer that. Yeah, I'll, I'll be covering that in a little bit right here. Um, okay. This is the question that you asked down there repairing damage. Right now, the only things you can repair are um, ball marks. And hole plugs, um, and, and hole plugs, you know, by default, just the size of the hole. Um, the county local rules will make that a little bigger, but right now, those are the only two things you can fix. In 2019, <coughs> damage on the putting green can be repaired. That can include spike marks, it can include footprints, it can include hoof marks, anything that is damage to the putting green. It doesn't include aeration holes, and it doesn't include normal maintenance practices where they slice through the green, etc. Those are just normal things you, you have to deal with. That. The, the intent is that you should be able to putt with the green the, the way that it was intended to be. So if somebody, three, whatever, scuffs the green up, you get to, to fix that. The other thing that you, you don't get to fix is network, you know, what they call natural wear. You know, the, the, they haven't changed the hole for three days and you know, it's kind of it's scuffy. Unfortunately, you've got to deal with that. But if somebody's used their putter to hook the ball out and they've damaged the hole, you can fix that. Um, those, are, those are certainly you know, improvements, I think, to the 2019 rules. You can fix them with pretty much anything that you hold that, that um, is, is equipment, uh, ball mark, repair kit. Um, we, there, there are some restrictions in how long you take to do it. You know, we don't want you going all over the whole green and fixing everything. Um, <laughs> new delay still applies. So here we have a situation where there's, you know, there's um, spike marks. The 2019 rules allow you to repair almost any damage on the cutting green. In addition to ball marks and old bolt plugs, you are allowed to repair spike marks and any other damage caused by shoes, repair animal damage, and repair damage caused by maintenance practices. The fixing and repairing of the cutting green must be done promptly and must not improve your life play beyond the repair of the damage. Okay, the, another big change in 2019, you can putt the ball with the flagstick in the hole. And if the ball hits the flagstick, there is no penalty. A couple of conditions around that. You have to make the decision uh, that you want the flagstick left in the hole before you play the stroke. So you know, that's, that's a decision you have to make before you play the stroke. Um, Play the stroke and then decide, oh no, I'm going to leave it in there. If 
you told, if you've told somebody to attend the flag um, and you part, if it doesn't get moved before the ball gets there and, it, and the ball hits it, then, then we're in a, a penalty situation. If that was accidental, maybe not, but if it was deliberate, if the, the person attending it deliberately left it there because they thought that the ball was going to um, you know, go off the green, then that, that could well be uh, a penalty situation. But generally, I see this as being used. You've chipped onto the green, you're six inches from the hole, you just want to tap the ball in. There's no question that you probably leave the flag in and just um, put it in instead of trying to jump on the hole in the flag and, and front. But there's a little bit of a video here that will talk about that. You aren't required to leave it in, but you can choose for every stroke that you make on putting green to leave it in or take it out. You know, it's a it's a stroke by stroke decision. Under the 2019 rules, there is no penalty for hitting the fly stick that is in the hole when you played your stroke from off the putting green, or if you played your stroke from on the green. So in 2018, that's okay too, if it hit because he was off the green. So if you want to leave the fly stick in the hole, perhaps to save time or because you think it helps you, there is no penalty if your ball hits it. If your ball is not whole, play it as advised. Okay, questions about fly sticks. No equipment, wasn't it? It was equipment, yes. Um, Penalty areas. I think Robin, when you talked about um, the definition of penalty areas, it, it includes what are currently defined as water hazards, no matter water hazards, any body of water. Um, but it also includes other things that the committee may, may decide to identify as a penalty area. One of the, the, the good reason to define something as a penalty area that isn't a water hazard is if it's, it's an area where the, the relief options for an unplayable ball are extremely difficult. It's in, it's in a gully, it's in a, in a big wooded area. You found your ball, but the only option you have for that area is to go back to play from where you previously played. Those are the situations where it may well be appropriate to define that wooded area, whatever, as a penalty area. So that the, there's an additional relief area of relief options for you to go lateral or you know, maybe even go back on a line. But generally, it gives you the lateral option that would not be available under the un unplayable rule because of all the junk that's around the ball. So you know, those are some considerations that the committee has to take into account. We don't recommend that you just arbitrarily paint red lines around all your wooded areas, but um, you know, it, there certainly can be some situations where it, it could be appropriate. And uh, the, the last item there, we don't talk about hazards anymore. We have penalty areas and we have bunkers, and they're two distinct areas of the course. Red and yellow water hazards, two things that most golfers are pretty familiar with. Now, one of the big changes in 2019, though, is the introduction of this concept of penalty areas, the, the ability for committees to now mark additional areas with red lines. So I think 2019, moving forward, we're actually going to see more red lines than dollars. I think that's correct, and we'd be happy to see that. We, we, on many golf courses around the world, we'll see areas such as this. The difficult areas to find your golf ball, and difficult areas to play from. And, and, and by being able to mark them as red hazards, we give the player a release option outside. So just outside the red line, they can then drop on a penalty of one stroke uh, within uh, two club lengths of all of that point. Of view. I mean, this change is really all about giving some flexibility to the committee when, when it comes to defining their golf course. But because we are going to see more red lines, there's now the opportunity for players to find their balls in more situations. You know, similar to this, if, if my ball is there, I may well want to play it. 
right? Under the current rules, there are a number of things I can't do. I can't run on my club or move loose impediments. All of those things come 2019 as part of the rule of modernization issue. Those go away as well. So if a player wants to play their ball, they're now going to have the ability to, to do some things that today they wouldn't allow for. Again, I think just offering that flexibility to the player, you know, you can play the ball as it lies, you can do all these things, or you can take away from their penalty one struck. I think that's all important. It is important and, and, and a key element, a uh, key theme throughout the modernization process was trying to speed the game up. And, and we think that, that these changes in and around penalty areas will do just that make uh, a wonderful game just that little bit quicker and therefore that little bit better. So um, you can see the, 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 the restrictions that are currently in place for trying to play a ball out of a deadline the area. Um, they, they typically go away. You can move as impediments in a penalty area. You can take practice uh, swings and, and hit the ground. You can ground your club. Um, when you are about to take a stroke. So that, that's a lot easier for you to do. This was first. So, um, were there bushes and bushes? Can you move those bushes and branches? Can someone hold a bush or branch for you? Those no. <laughs> um, what, what, what you saw there was the player moving this in um, you cannot, again, change the conditions of the yeah. We have a lot of rock in our desert uh, areas. How big a rock is you allowed to move on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there was a decision that, that identified it pretty much as, as any size, as long as it can be done um, reasonably quickly. No, the, there's no, there's nothing that says you have to do it by yourself in the Yeah, that's correct. Uh, if, if it's solidly embedded, if you have to dig it out of the ground, that's not, it has to be a loose impediment, as Rogers indicated. And so uh, that's the only requirement. I mean, the, the, the way that we try to judge that is if you can grasp it with your fingers and lift it up, it's a loose impediment. If you have to take a T and dig it up, then it's not a loose impediment. Doesn't matter that there's a, a hole underneath it. If it's loose, then it's a loose impediment. Okay, uh, in the bank first, and then I'll come to you. If you have a ball that goes into a uh, penalty area, into say a, a, a tall grass area or that wooded area, and you can't find it, you declare the laws fall and go back? Or no. You it, 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 it depends on whether there is known or virtually certain that the ball is in that penalty area. Same 95% known or certain, uh, virtual certainty that the ball is in there. If that is that standard is met, then you can take relief, you estimate where it crossed, and you, you decide what relief option you want to take. So, the, yeah, the question was, if the ball goes into a uh, into a penalty area and you can't find it, um, yeah, what do you do? You, you have to make a determination that it is actually there, 95% no reversion certain, and then you can take the relief. Um, so, what's happening when you're in a penalty area and you are swinging opposite range of the or something? Well, then you, you might well have a problem. I mean, that's again improving your. I didn't hear the question. Oh, sorry, I just had a question. Question was you, you decided you want to play your ball in a, from a penalty area. And you take a practice swing um, and you knock a branch off of the bush that is in your area of intended swing. That would still be a penalty. Yeah, the same, same as today. Anything that you improve. Or line stance, area of intended swing, or line of play uh, would be a two stroke penalty if it creates an advantage for you. So if you take a powerful back swing and knock a branch out of the way, and now you have a nice easy swing, uh, that would be two penalty strokes. Does that answer the question? Well, no, that's, that's, um, that's a different issue. That's um, back swing knocks a branch off. If you if you make the make the stroke, then I think you're 
Good. Correct, Robert? Correct. That's still, yeah. It's, it's prior to the stroke, if you, if you improve your area affecting the stroke. But you have to complete that stroke, otherwise you get right. Yeah, just just like today, you take a back swing and break a branch, and you make you continue the motion of the club and play the stroke. There's no penalty. Okay. Um, I'll come to you in a second. Go ahead. Okay. Your whole process is you know, that area of the know about the spot you, you, in, in all cases, the, the relief, the reference point for relief from the penalty area is where it last crossed the margin or the edge is the new term, the edge of the penalty area. And, and if you, you, know, you, you make your best effort to estimate that, you get agreement with your group. Hey, I think you crossed here, that's, that's where your reference point is. And then you take your relief from there. Okay. In your penalty area, Well, that's a very good question. Uh, we, we, will, we will address that shortly. Yeah, we, we talked about you can move this impediments um, in, in the penalty area. That's, that's, that's fine. Um, if you find your ball in a penalty area and want to pay for there, the same rules apply as when playing the ball from the fairway or the rough. So before making a stroke, you are allowed to move those impediments. Make practice when to touch the ground or any water inside the penalty area and ground your club near your ball. So, I don't know if you caught that, you, you can touch the water in a, in a, a penalty area. So, if you're wearing you know, dark colored trousers, you might want to take a practice swing in the water just to see how it's going to be. Um, white trousers, I wouldn't recommend that. Roger, a few of these things. I know if it's 4 o'clock and if anybody needs to leave, you won't feel insulted by the fact that you want to be on your schedule. We will make a valiant attempt to not to speed up yes. too too long in the last slides, and some of the last slides are pretty brief. Um, to answer your question about taking um, lateral relief on the opposite margin of a of a penalty area, current rules you can do that. In the new rules, that option is taken away from you unless the committee has put it in place as a local rule. For either all of the lateral hand, all of the penalty areas, or specific ones. If you have one that that where that makes sense, then there can be a local rule that allows you that option. But generally, in the rules, that option goes away. And, and here's a, you know, just a diagram that yeah. um, if, you're, if your ball were to actually go into the, 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 the penalty area from the left hand side, um, if there's a local rule in place, you could actually drop it um, within two club lengths on the federal side. So in a bunker, right now you can't do very much in a bunker. But um, get sand in your shoes. Um, right now, in the new rules, you can move loose impediments. Um, you can um, touch the sand. You can stand with your club in the sand. Um, the, the restriction is you can't test the condition of the sand and you can't improve the area of, of uh, your eye or your intended swing. So, um, you can't make a practice swing in the sand. Question? You, you, no. You can stand, and right now there's a restriction, but if you stand with your leaning on your club in the, in the bunker, then that, that would be a penalty. Um, you can lay your clubs down, but if you're holding your club and it touches the sand, that's a penalty in the, in the current rules. The new rules, that's okay. As long as you're not testing the condition of the sand, like you, know, you can't take a rake and stick it in the sand and see how deep it is. Um, 
but uh, you you cannot improve the, the line. There's a video that, that describes that really clearly. I think. That's that. Some bunker restrictions continue to exist. For example, you are still not allowed to touch the sand with your glove, behind or in front of your wall. When making a practice swing, or when making your back swing. <laughs> I'm not sure how many people do that. Is that is that answer the question? Okay, so now this this I think this is probably the last one I'm going to do. Um, this is uh, a, a somewhat changed from the current rules for a ball on play when the bunker. Some of them are, are the same, but um, the, there are some minor differences. The first thing. When your board is unplayable in the bunker, you have four different options to, to get relief. The first one is to take stroke and distance. To go back down to the bunker to where you previously played, find a reference point, which is where you played from, and take the one problem relief area. That costs you one stroke to do that. Stroke and distance is always one stroke. And you see up on the, on the screen, you know, number one, top left hand corner, that's going back to where they previously played from outside the bunker. The second option is to go back on a line, same thing as, as we talked about earlier, except that the ball has to be in the bunker. The line goes back to the flag through where the ball is, but you've got to figure out your reference area in the bunker. Again, one stroke penalty, for, for taking that relief option. So that's item number two. Number three is lateral relief. So wherever the ball is, um, that's uh, you, you take your relief area two club lengths inside the bunker still and figure out a relief area and you can drop the ball within that area. But again, it's still in the bunker. Now, if none of those are attractive to you, the new rules give you a fourth option, which is to come out of the bunker on the line from the flag through where the ball was, as far back as you want, but that's going to cost you two strokes. One from the unplayable and then one to get out of the bunker. So again, if it's buried deep into the, the, the face of the bunker, you may decide that the two strokes is better than you having the way at but you have three or four strokes. Is that is that clear? We had some questions about that this morning. Hopefully we've we've improved that. So how about identifying uh, a fry egg that really is your ball? You can't see Okay. Well you you can certainly mark and lift your ball to identify it. Um, you can you can certainly do that. I mean that's that's no that hasn't changed, right? You can yeah. um yeah, anywhere on the golf course, and we'll talk about that briefly in a couple of minutes. There's a slight change to the process that you can always lift your ball to identify it anywhere on the golf course. Now you may have to recreate the line when you put it back, because I think we always talked about if you lift your ball and have to um, replace it, you have to replace it underneath this grass thing or in the sand, same, same kind of deal. When you decide your ball in a bunker is unplayable, under the 2019 rules, we have an extra option that lets you drop back on the line outside the bunker for a penalty of two strokes. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through where your unplayable ball is. Identify a spot on that line as far behind the bunker as you like. Measure or estimate a one club length wide relief area on either side of and behind that spot. Then drop a ball in that area. Your drop ball must land in and be played from the relief area. Okay, so any any other questions that um, I'll find there? I'll hand it over to Robert. Thanks, Ryan. I will make an effort to uh, close this out without too much. Yes, questions? <coughs>
That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so the question was, my ball is in a bunker, it has a steep, steep slope, and I'm going to drop in that relief area that Roger talked about, and if it's a steep slope, my knee height might be two or three inches above the sand. Well, that's the way it is. So it's not knee height, I mean, it's my body's knee height, it's not knee height from where it's supposed to land. Uh, I couldn't quite hear your quick comment. Well, you'll drop twice, and if it rolls out of the area, then you'll find a place where the ball will remain at rest, and you're not permitted to shove it into the sand to find a spot. And so it may be five, ten feet away from uh, the original place where it landed on the second drop. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly correct. No, no, that's just the way the rule is written. So, uh, and by the way, Roger and I will stay around for a bit if we don't get all the questions answered uh, that you may have or didn't want to ask. So we have a couple of items that are relatively straightforward. The first one is, if you have damaged a club during the round, or any way you do it, you damage it on a stroke in the rocks, you bang it against a tree because you're not happy with your last stroke, uh, you can continue to use that club. There is no possibility of the rules to replace that club. So you are restricted to 14 clubs. The only way you can replace a club is if you lay your club down and the maintenance vehicle drives over it or somebody in your group steps on it by mistake and damages the club. So a, a simple change, you might not always be happy. Uh, again, as it says here, if there's some uh, outside influence or natural forces, you know, a tree blows over and falls on your club, well, that wasn't your fault. But anything that you do with the club, you're stuck with. Distance measuring devices, this year you must have a local rule to permit use of a distance measuring device. In 2019, the rules permit it. However, the committee can adopt a local rule prohibiting it. So I don't think we'll see distance measuring devices at the U.S. Open uh, anytime soon. They'll prohibit it by a local rule. Okay, Roger, I pushed the wrong button and now it doesn't want to go ahead. Do you want to come up and click it once? This little device has a mind of its own. I think if you just advance it once, okay. Okay, uh, Cat, you're standing behind. This is complicated. I'll kind of go through it quickly. How many of you have caddies? Probably And you may have a partner in four ball. And this is related to the subject that was asked before about a partner standing behind a player. And so uh, I think this is designed mostly for caddies because we know that on some of the tours, the caddies are very helpful. Uh, also, a caddy can now lift the ball in the playing green and we have a couple of things that are simple. So here's the complex part. A player's caddy or partner, and we'll kind of focus on the partner for the most part, is not permitted to stand behind on a line behind the player while the player is taking his or her stance and until this player's stroke is made. So if, if I'm Roger's partner, when he begins to take his stance, I cannot be standing behind him. And if I am, and now putting green is, is different, but anywhere on the golf course, if I am there when he is preparing to play the shot, Roger will get a two-stroke penalty or loss a whole bingo. No releasing it, no nothing. 
gets it. So don't stand behind the player with your department. On the putting green, it's a little different. If Roger's on the putting green with his ball, and I stand behind him and I say, yeah, yeah, I can see your line and so on and so forth. If he moves, up, take, untakes his stance, I don't know if that's English language used properly or not, uh, but if he backs away from the stance and I get out of the way, there is no penalty when he plays the shot. So the rules are different for putting green or anywhere else on the golf course. On the putting green, there will be no player if the player gets out of the way from his or her position, and then I, as the partner, get out of the way and the player comes back. So I don't know whether people will remember this. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the tours uh, because they're so used to this. Hopefully, they will not get caught on it. And it's general penalty loss of hold. We're going to skip the video because I think I probably got it well enough. And I want to not have you too late in your departure. We appreciate your questions and your attention. So the way it is for 2019, if my ball is on the putting ring, my caddy or my partner can just go mark it, pick it up, and proceed. Uh, in 2018, it's only the owner of the golf ball. So it probably doesn't apply to any of us much, but there are some practical circumstances where the partner might, you know, while I'm going to get my partner, partner might say, okay, I'm ready to punt, I'll, I'll, you know, you don't have to get permission, but they can just mark the ball, pick it up, and life goes on. So uh, very straightforward in that regard. Uh, this rule, did, did it ever make sense that if I swing at my ball in a bunker and I'm a follow through, I hit the ball a second time, did I ever get an advantage from that? And the answer is no. So now there's no penalty. And as you've understood from a lot of Roger's commentary earlier, there are a lot of things that are a penalty this year. My ball's in a bunker, there's a pine cone 20 feet away from my ball in the bunker, and I throw it out of the bunker. Did I get an advantage? And the answer is no. In 2019, the rules don't care where the pine cone is in the bunker. You can get it out of the way, and there's no penalty. So a, a really good change. A couple of things that are just, I think we know this. I'll kind of talk over the slides as we go through. There's a lot of encouragement to play more promptly. Try to get your shots done in less than 40 seconds. Most of the time, we're so used to the courses we play, we don't have to try to figure out, okay, what club do I use here? I'm always a five iron away from the green on this pole. We don't need to be so analytical that we take more hours to play than we really need to play. And so a lot of the goal is, and the committees are encouraged to have a pace of play policy. I commented this morning, one of the clubs that I knew in Western New York, well, they actually had a time clock that stamped your scorecard after nine and 18 holes. And if you were lingering on the golf course, uh, you weren't playing on Saturday or Sunday morning or afternoon, you might be playing at three o'clock or four o'clock on Saturday because they didn't want you out there clogging up the golf course with your slow play. So, uh, and that was an interesting, interesting item. Uh, match play, an interesting item, I like it, uh, because we know today in match play, if Roger and I are playing single match play, and we agree to play out of turn, even though we know the rules say the ball farther from the hole, we're actually disqualified today. In 2019, if, you know, I chip up onto the green, Roger's ball is right near the hole. I've got to go get my putter. I can say to Roger, it's for each stroke, I can say, Roger, why don't you go ahead and hold up while I go get my putter and then we'll keep moving. We can agree on a particular stroke to play on a turn. And I think that's great. Uh, as I say, in 2018, it's a DQ for both of us for agreeing to waive rule at all. Uh, I'm going to skip this because it just talks about trying to play promptly, I want to cover this item because it's a little complicated. 
And uh, I don't know where the project with you will be to stop the video at some point. So this is the local rule that they, you can adopt. I don't know whether it makes sense here or not. Uh, that will be up to the chorus, men's group, women's group. So it says if a player's ball has not been found, the video is pretty good. Or he's known to be out of bounds. You know, since I saw it go over the wall into somebody's yard or out into the road somewhere. Uh, there is this alternative to stroke and distance. And part of it, I'll just get this in. Let's just say I can't find my ball and I've been looking for five or eight or ten minutes because I don't pay attention. And Roger and I are in the group. I said, well, I guess I've got to go back to replay. And I look back there, there are two groups waiting on the tee. Uh, do I really want to go back? And the answer is no. So sometimes the local rule might be helpful. And so, first of all, we have to estimate where is the ball on a course that I can't find? And you'll see in a video a, a good example. Or where did it go out of bounds? Because I saw it land in the, on the roof of the house off to the right side, which is where my balls would go. And so that's a reference point. But then the other reference point is the point of the fairway and the hole being played that's nearest to the ball reference point. So if my ball's on the right side, went out of bounds, I come back toward the fairway, and there will be a reference point that's the same distance from the hole as best estimate of where it went out of bounds or is in the impenetrable bush. Okay. So here's the video, and Roger may stop it on a couple of occasions. When your ball is lost or out of bounds, your course can use a local rule that does not require you to play under stroke and distance. Here is how it works. For two penalty strokes, estimate where you think your original ball is or where it went out of bounds. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through that estimated point. Next, estimate the point on the nearest edge of the fairway that is the same distance from the hole. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through that estimated point. The relief area where you can drop and play your ball for two penalty strokes will be quite large. Anywhere as much as two club lengths outside of the two lines and between them, but not nearer the hole than the spot where you estimated your original ball is lost. You cannot use this local rule if your ball is lost in a penalty area or if you have played a provisional ball. I think that worked out pretty well. I think Rogers, is it clear enough that it's going to be anywhere from where you think the ball is over two, two club lengths onto the fairway from that, from that second reference point? So the first reference point is where do we think the ball either went out of bounds or is in the impenetrable bush? The second reference point is then the same distance from the hole on the fairway, and then we measure two club lengths onto the fairway, by the way, so you don't have to drop them off or somewhere else. And then that area, you can go back as far as you wish on the course. So if it's like 60 yards from the green and my money club is 90 yards, uh, 90 yard shot, I'll just walk back on the fairway to the 90 yard point in that zone that was marked uh, with those white area drop the ball, because again, when we're taking relief, we're dropping, and play it from there. So it's, it, it costs you two strokes, so it's somewhat similar to going back under stroke and distance for one, and then hitting another ball, which for many of us wouldn't be in as good a spot as if I dropped it in the fairway. So uh, the, the one question this morning that came up, in terms of scoring it. So you hit the ball from the, the team area, it's gone into the bush, that ball is lane one. You've uh, determined that you want to take this relief option, you come out and you, you drop the ball in, the, um, in, in that relief area, you're going to take two penalty strokes. So that ball is now lane three, and the stroke you've made is four. 
as Robin said, it's, it's the same as going back to the T, but it's you've added two, and now you get to drop it. So T shot is one, two to drop it in the fairway. So now you're laying three, and then the fourth shot is the shot you play from there. Is that clear? A couple of little items. I think they're still little. I hope so. Uh, you can decide for a particular hole or the whole course to use a uh, maximum score. It could be like double par pickup, which a lot of the high school kids play in their early days in tournaments. Or you could say double bogey, pick or pick a number on the hole would be the maximum so that you actually don't even have to play the hole. Uh, we talked about that with one of the groups this morning that a particular hole over at Saddlebrook uh, that some people score 25 on or whatever. Well, you can just decide it's going to be an eight and you can just skip the hole and put an eight down on your scorecard. Uh, that, all, that all works. So you don't need to finish the hole or complete the hole. And there probably are, that's just an, another form that you have to associate it with that round of golf. I mean, right, yeah, that's so right. You know, the committee has to say, this is, we're playing this on the maximum. Yeah, you can't just decide to do it. You could have a tournament where you had maximum score. Uh, player conduct, just to say that, uh, well, we'll skip through. The, the committee can decide, and I'd like the committee to not get too carried away. You know, if somebody says a bad word, we're going to disqualify them, or it's two strokes, and the next time a bad word is eight strokes, or something like that. But it's expected under the rules that players are going to be ladies and gentlemen on the golf course, and committees can put together. And I think it'll be mostly, uh, you know, one of the things that goes on at NCAA tournaments is they give stroke penalties for things that they don't want people to do, well, you can't do that this year. You can do it next year. And so I think some of it is to just have things that uh, where people don't, I don't mean to sound awful, where people make up stuff for local rules or tournaments. Uh, it should be all only what's in the guidebook that's permitted. Uh, if you need to lift your ball for some reason, this is another change that's somewhat important, but you don't need to announce what you're going to do or have somebody come and watch you mark it lifted and replace it. So if I can't tell them that's my ball and I want to lift it for identification, or I think it might be on a, over, a sprinkler head is under the grass that's laying over a sprinkler head, I can I still have to mark it to lift it, and I can't clean it, as you'll see in the notes. Uh, but I can do that on my own. I don't need to announce it to somebody my intent. It's not a bad idea, but it's not required under the rules. It is required today to do that. Okay. Uh, and we've sort of talked about this before. Let me put the items up. If, if, if I make a good faith effort in making a measurement of my one club length and I'm just off by a little bit, but I really made an attempt. I had the club not exactly in the right place when I made the measurement and I proceeded. There's not going to be a two-stroke penalty for not doing things. If you made, it says, if the first bullet, if the player did all that can be reasonably expected under the circumstances, uh, that's going to be acceptable. And I think that's fine myself. Uh, we'll take questions. We'll probably close it. Just there's some notes here. Uh, Al has the master copy of some of this information if you need it. And uh, Roger and I will kind of pack a few things up. Please ask us questions. Thanks for all your great questions and thanks for your attendance.